about, when we were thinking about uh, perhaps having all these marvelous speakers over at the first TEDx of Cambridge, um, I began to think what a great TED, TED idea could be. I don't know if I reached upon a great TED idea, but I hope it's at least a decent one. Um, and I began to think, but it wasn't until last night, in fact, on a train ride, that everything just kind of came together and coalesced, the conference happened. So this is a story about three great conversations I've had with total strangers, whom I have never met, whom I had never met before, and whom I will probably never meet again. And each of them taught me a lot. I hope they teach you a little bit, teach you a lot, and uh, they go to the heart of what resilience, at least for me, is. <clears throat> This is the uh, first of the stories. And the lesson here is that our identities are not our credentials. About four months ago, I was invited to a lunch at Georgetown, you know, Georgetown, uh, the Georgetown part of DC. And it was a, it was a lunch primarily of young professionals and uh, some people who faff about like I do. And uh, one of the conversations was, and these were all people who were fairly well educated, they had gone to uh, uh, well-credentialed schools. They were working in government, some for members of Congress, uh, federal agencies, one was a Supreme Court law clerk, things like that. And some were in financial institutions and so on. And one of the questions that came up was, would you ever marry anybody who didn't have a college degree? And the vote on that one was a whopping 12 to 2. And that really got me thinking. Uh, somebody else, uh, somebody who works for Amnesty International and I were the two dissenters who voted in favor of, yes, we would marry somebody who didn't have a college degree. It wouldn't really make that much of a difference. Uh, that really got me thinking about how much emphasis people place on credentials. You know, the most famous question in Washington, D.C. is, or New York, or you know, perhaps London as, too, London as well, among young people, is where did you go to school? That is the, that is the greatest uh, way to show one upsmanship or whatever. And I thought that was, you know, that was such a particularly important uh, kind of issue to bring up at Cambridge TEDx. I'm a, I'm a Cambridge alumnus, but I try really hard, and I know people in this room try really hard, not to let that become part of our identity. That's a credential, and Cambridge lives on in our hearts and minds, but it's not the ideological fault line by which we judge somebody, somebody's uh, work as a human being or their uh, uh, merit to be or not to be our friend. We have spoken of knowledge economies today. We have spoken of Ugandan prisoners and fundamental rights. We have spoken of people connecting uh, through resilience. We have spoken of true facts. Um, and we have, we have thought greatly about each of these issues. But I really do think that the ambition to connect with others, the ambition to shed the facade and the veneer of the credentials and assuming, um, the, assuming what makes us us, our identities, our human angle, makes, uh, makes, it, makes it much more likely, if not uh, requires it of us, if we are to be resilient and to survive it. So, I was joking with a friend of mine that after I talked about this, I would never be uh, a candidate for Senate confirmation for anything, ever, even if some president were silly enough to nominate me. And this was in Amsterdam about two years ago. A friend and I, we were like, oh, this is really interesting. Let us walk through the red light district and let us understand what goes on, the pathology of it, the pain of it, the joy some people receive from it, the whole nine yards. And we are, we are talking about um, a 55-year-old sex worker called Rieka, and we had a seven-hour conversation with her. We had a seven-hour conversation with her about why she does what she does and what makes her her, what makes her tick, what makes her get up in the morning, and all sorts of things. And this is what she said. She said she's not ashamed of it, because I've still got my dignity, or human dignity, where I want to go, that's hope and aspiration, and 
I have some solid footing to tell my kids to work hard. And that last part really stuck with me. It stuck with me because it's, it was almost poetic and miracle that no matter how bad things get, there is that safety valve, there is that salvation that you can connect with your pain, your disappointments, your setbacks with somebody else. So it's never, ever, ever truly in vain. But you have to get in that mindset. You have to put yourself in that position of thinking that this is rough, this is tough, but I'm going to get through it, and boy, am I going to have a great story to tell. The last year or so, I have been obsessed with what's called the LSAT. It's the law school admissions test in the United States, and my friends here know what a, what a uh, joy it's been to me. Um, and I tried to figure out, I tried to diagram what's the, the deductions I've made in life through a necessary and sufficient statement. And the, the necessary and sufficient statement is that in order to get truly long term success via resilience, we need to have the ambition to connect. We, not, we must human, humanize ourselves. We must share vulnerabilities, not deficiencies. Now, that is a tricky line, sharing vulnerabilities as opposed to deficiencies. Because we're like, you know, in any kind of business environment or even a social environment, we want to represent ourselves with the best foot forward. People don't like to talk about their setbacks. People don't like to talk about their failures and their limitations and, you know, let's see, I got a calculus. Things like that. They talk about, oh, I've started a new company. I have uh, been, uh, I have been named uh, chairman of the year. Things like that. But that, that's the great irony of it. The connections we form with with others can be just as impressive, just as reflective of solid intellectual, physical prowess, into diligence, space, candle power. The whole works if we choose to. Uh, focus on them as a human being, as opposed to just an object of our um, just an object of our appreciation, and and somebody who should we would think appreciate us. That cuts out the flummery and candelabra, as I like to put it, and it puts us in the most. I think it's the most Pareto efficient strategy. You get the best of all the worlds, and the the minute satisfaction you might get about gloating for those five seconds are. Uh, are not, uh, which would be quite harmful, no longer happening. And in fact, the savviest consumers, kingmakers, and kings happen to know this. I happen to know it too, though I'm not any of those things. And I say this because I've had to work very hard, but in many ways life came easy. I ate school, didn't have any trouble, got into a great undergrad, got into, got into here and at Oxford, uh, got in, uh, became a pilot, published a couple of books, started a few companies, one of which was successful, some of which were not. Um, I, uh, with the help of many people in this room, ended up writing uh, uh, part of the proposed constitution of Tunisia, ended up defending people on death row on an appellate level in Texas. But there was something missing. There was, there was the element of, I had, I had planned out my life. I had made it into a pre-planned checklist. The tick boxes were there, and they were all ticked off. Something was missing. What gives? That was the question. Why was there the lack of bliss? I had followed the process. I had done yada, yada, yada. But somewhere there was unhappiness. And at that point, it was a, a tremendous game that I discovered the idea of role reversal. The idea of role reversal is very simple. Role reversal, role reversal is that no matter what your privileges are, and you may not think you have any, but everybody in this room has thousands of privileges. It's just a that they are perhaps dormant, and perhaps they are uh, not dormant, they are out there. But it's a matter of tracking your privileges and reaching out and connecting with the people who don't have it, and people who somehow suffer, suffer a sense of insecurities and non-inclusiveness. They feel shut out, they feel like pariahs. And you can use your own setbacks, your own uh, sense of loss to connect with them. And I think that that can have tremendous impact. I, I was told by somebody that uh, somebody, somebody I know, their uh, partner
partner died of uh, um, HIV in uh, 1999. And there's this photo on their mantle of the partner and Princess Di. And Princess Di, uh, the, the, the caption is, the partner was saying to the late Princess of Wales, you're, you're a princess, but I'm a queen, exclamation mark. <laughs> and, you know, it sounds really uh, comedic, and it is. But there was something more in that. Uh, everybody knew that the late Princess of Wales had had tremendous difficulties in life and so on. But the one redeeming feature about her was that she took the pain and difficulties of her own life to do what she could to try to help. And we are all flawed, we are all broken, we are all strong. But how we choose to use it is completely up to us. And I think that not just as a matter of moral theory, I'm not a moral philosopher, and I'm not going to preach about it, it's uh, tremendously important to reach out in that way, which also happens to guarantee our short, long-term professional and personal success. Now, Michael was very kind to mention that I used to work, and I still work in some capacity, as a death row advocate in Texas. I do federal abuse. But there was this one case that I can't forget. It is the most uh, memorable case of a lifetime, perhaps. And that case was a case called Barrientos versus Texas. I will never forget that case because the facts were appalling. A legit prisoner, uh, given the facts, he probably didn't do it, of a first degree murder. He asked the court for a court appointed lawyer because he didn't have any money. He got. <laughs> Uh, they say, be careful what you ask for. This attorney became uh, a leaguer for the district attorney's office. And uh, once, uh, and uh, after a few months, it turns out he was both on, uh, both appointed, retained by our, who became our client, Marco Barrientos, as his attorney, as well as the DA's lawyer. A couple of months later, the DA in Harris County, Texas, uh, appointed this very, this very gentleman to prosecute our client. Appalling facts, you know. But the case went up through the Texas courts and went away, went up all the way to the United States Supreme Court. They didn't want it. Um, client is still on death row. And I couldn't really bring myself, I still haven't been able to bring myself to accept that this happened in Texas. This happened in Texas, the United States, on our watch. But it did. And that was a remarkably transformative moment in my life. That was the moment I realized that Yes, it's tough, one must get up, and so on. But that, I must do more, not just be an appellate advocate, dealing with, uh, you know, uh, being so personally inhibited that I would not deal with the human side of it. I would not visit the death row prisoners or things like that, things that Alex has done far better than I have. But that was the moment that I decided to make that community a part of my life. And it was important to me because a couple of, couple of, uh, uh, half a year later, it just, you know, life comes full circle. A couple of years later, in Tunisia, when we were, uh, when, uh, when we were on the uh, Constitution Exercise Project over there, it so happened that I was having a conversation with this 14-year-old girl called Taiba, and uh, on the rooftop of Taiba's home, because her brother was a dear friend of mine, still a dear friend of mine. And I was talking to her about, I wanted to understand, what the adolescent in Tunisia thought of the Arab Spring, and uh, what their perspective was. Did they see it as having real potency, or was it just kind of uh, quite a bit of posturing? And she wasn't really interested in talking about the Arab world. She was interested in talking about our experiences in Texas. And it was remarkable that that yearning for understanding somebody, a prisoner, she's Arab, our clients are typically Hispanic and black. Um, the yearning to understand what makes him human, what makes him him, you know, going beyond the fact that he had quite a few felonies to his name, he had quite a few uh, records, didn't have any money, different culture, different language, she wanted to understand that. And, you know, it's just that the, those suffering voices are all around us. They don't speak loudly, but they speak the same way. Um, that the disabled speak in a lot of, in many respects. It's in the law we call it the contribution to society test. Do they contribute to society or do they not? That will possibly decide whether or not they get protected class classification. But I really, I, I began to think 
that it's not a matter of whether or not we see them uh, as contributing to society. The, the, question, the real question is whether or not we are able to see the contribution that they make to society, uh, if only within ourselves. And it's that ability to say that, yes, I've had a setback. Yes, I've had problems. Yes, I've had limitations. Yes, I've had this and that. But no matter how bad things are, not only will they get better, which they will, but also they give us a great story to tell. Help us become more and more resilient, which will also lead us to long-term success. Thank you so much for having me. I don't know if that's a great idea.